Good afternoon, everyone. I can't hear you guys. I need more energy. Good afternoon, everyone. Awesome. So my name is Remy Dada, and today I'm presenting about where design and technology meet, forging the future of value-centric architecture. So if you are in this room to learn about how technology is adding incremental changes to the architectural practice, you're in the wrong room. Because today, that's not what I'm presenting. I'm talking about the radical shifts that are happening that can either empower you or put you guys out of work. And today, I want you guys to try to change your thinking. If there's anything I achieved today, is to change your thinking. I'm going to talk about four things. The first thing is how to own the product and add value. The second thing is how to participate much earlier in the value in the value chain. The third thing is how to use data, be more data-centric. And the fourth thing is how to exit your business or how to empower yourself with artificial intelligence. But most importantly, today I'm telling you guys how to make money. You guys don't seem excited. Okay, so we're now speaking the same language. So. I run a company called Space Finish, and we are where design and technology converge. Before Space Finish, I worked, I worked as an architect for a while, and then I left architecture because the money wasn't good. And I'm sure you guys can relate to that. And then I went to work in technology. I worked at Google for a while. Then I worked at YouTube. And then I started a company called Space Finish, and now a new company called Campus. Right. So the first talking point today is own the product and control the value. What this really means is right now as architects, you provide a service. So you are trading your, your, your time for money. It's that simple. When you receive a RFP from a client, they ask you what is your billing rate. But the challenge is when you are trading your time for money, you are using a service-based model. What I want us to begin to do is to begin to redefine how we see ourselves as architects. You see, me for one, I tell my team all the time, I don't see myself as, a, as an architect. I see myself as a solution for businesses. So regardless of what that business needs is, I can provide a solution. The first change comes with how you see your identity. When you change your identity, the opportunities begin to look a lot different. So around owning the product, what I'm literally saying is, how do we embrace technology to allow us to create solutions that are more impactful in a more productized way over the traditional way when we are trading our time for money, when we do architectural services? Is that clear? Okay. So, I'll skip through a couple of slides. So, the first thing is, look, you either are going to disrupt things or be disrupted. And I'll give you four, four examples. So over here, there are, there are four industries. And these industries, what they all have in common is, these, are, these industries are over 100 years old. They've been restaurants for over a century, offices, hotels, taxis. But what they all have in common is all these businesses were disrupted by technology. Let's take restaurants for example. How many of you guys order food today? Show of hands. And does the food arrive at your house? So it reduces your need to go to the restaurants. That's one way companies like Jumia Food are disrupting restaurants. Or offices. How many of you guys have worked in a co-working space before? Show of hands. Again, co-working spaces have allowed people to access offices before. You would have to pay a lot of money to access offices. What about hotels? How many of you have used an Airbnb before? Again, Airbnb is you know, changing the game. And how many of you have used Ubers before? Show of hands. Only three of you have used Uber in this whole, in this whole space. I need participation. So again, all these industries were disrupted by technology. So let's look at, let's look at hotels. Value is being created over 100 times at a fraction of time. So let's look at Hilton. Hilton is an old, very strong brand. They've been around for over 100 years. Their value right now is $42 billion. A lot of money. 
Airbnb has been around for about 15 years. And right now, they are actually about 92 billion, not 86, 92 billion. But what is very interesting is that in a fraction of the time, Airbnb has doubled their value over Hilton without owning a single piece of real estate. Let that sink in. So the question I ask you guys is, how did they do that? You are saying something there? Technology. They are leveraging technology. That's the only way that they could have done this. So, when you think about scalability, scaling your business is having the ultimate leverage. And the idea is, you want to put in minimal input, but get maximum output. So that we can go and relax and spend our time doing more fun things. The whole goal is not to work hard until you're tired, it's to put in minimal work, but get maximum value in return. And the formula for that kind of leverage is technology plus the internet. You see, we all grew up with the internet, so we are all very used to it. But how many of you guys today are really using the internet to, meet, to sell your services to a global client, clientele base? Do you guys have clients from China? from Germany, there's no reason why you can't because the internet allows you to reach anyone. When you add the internet with technology, internet of things, artificial intelligence, data, you can now really expand and maximize the value that you can bring. And that's the whole concept of scalability. You see, in the future, the language we all need to speak is not Yoruba, it's not Igbo, it's not Hausa, it's not English, it's not French. The language we need to speak is what? The answer is on the screen. I can't hear you guys. The language we all need to speak is code. It's very, very simple. If you can instruct a computer to do something for you, you can buy back your time and use it for other things. And today, you guys all do it. When you call for an Uber and you request a ride, a lot of things are happening in the background. Right? Those are instructions you are sending to the computer. And in a future that is very artificial heavy, artificial intelligence heavy, being able to speak that language gives you a lot of leverage. Now, you don't have to be a computer programmer because today we have AI solutions that just allow you to ask the question and they do all the programming for you. So the question is, if architects could talk, speak the language of code, and instruct computers, what kind of requests would you be asking for? Would, would you be asking for things that free up your time as a designer, improves how you respond to briefs, add more value to your clients? You see, right now, we're all consumers of software. But I'm trying to change our perceptions that we don't just have to consume software, we can participate in creating software. And that is ultimate power for architects. And it is easier today than it's ever been because of how accessible all this technology is. So I have a big enemy, 24 hours. 24 hours is my biggest enemy because no matter how much I want to charge my clients per hour, I still just have 24 hours in a day. So when we talk about leveraging technology and the internet, we are able to now give computers instructions through code and make money while we sleep. Do you guys think the people at Facebook are working every hour to earn money? When you open up Facebook and you look at an ad, they earn money. You don't have to trade your time to make money. And that is the shift that I want us in this room to change our minds towards. So, we too are building our own products at Space Finish. So this picture was taken uh, a short while ago. We launched our product and we worked with, with the NASDAQ Stock Exchange in New York City. So they got to announce it and put our faces on the billboard in Times Square, which was a very big deal for us. But the important aspect about this is that if we as architects are trying to participate to own our own products, then you guys too can do the same thing. So I'm not asking to do things that we are not trying to do. So I'm trying to use our story to inspire you, to let you know that it's actually possible. So 
let's talk about participating much earlier in the value chain. The way the value chain actually works is like this. Your customer has a problem, right? And they do some research, right? They set their budget. Then they create an RFP. They shortlist you. They don't consult you. They just shortlist you. Then they hire you, and they tell you what to do. But at that point in time, the budget has been set. The location has been set. The business plan has been set. And we have minimal influence in what we can do. So what I'm saying is, if we change our mindset, we can actually participate much earlier when the conversations are being had, when the business planning is happening. Why don't architects have a seat at that table? And that is what I'm challenging today. So I'm going to give you three situations in how I have tried to do that within my own capacity. So as my company Space Finish, we work with leading brands who are coming into Africa and we help them set up office spaces so they can be more productive. But what we've been able to do with our sales is we try to insert ourselves much earlier in the conversation. So let's look at Facebook. So this is a picture of me in Menlo Park, Facebook's headquarters in California giving a presentation to the team at Facebook. But what I'm talking about is the challenges of infrastructure in Africa and how it's going to limit them to be successful on the continent. You see, that topic is not your typical topic that an architect would talk about. But what I understand is if I'm helping them solve their problems much earlier, when they do have a project, we'll be first in line. And when we are first in line, we're going to more or less be partners versus being a vendor that they hired. So when Facebook came to Lagos to set up their office, it was very easy for us to be the people that did that. Not only did we design and build their office, we helped manage the entire process. And they were engaging us at a different level of the value chain. So I'll give you another example. Being a facilitator. So when you're a facilitator, you don't have to be the person that has all the money. But we all have our connections. When you bring people together, what happens is all the business deals that happen in that conversation, you can now key into it, right? And that's the mentality. So in this picture is myself, Mr. Felicia Phillips, Aliko, and Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of Twitter. This was a meeting that I set up. And I brought all these guys together. And the kind of conversations they were having was way above my pay grade. But I was in the room. So when Twitter was moving into Africa, obviously we were the ones helping to make that thing happen. And this is a tr recurring trend that I'm trying to make you guys understand. Let's look at one last e example. Creating pathways for investments. So when I was at Google, I worked really closely to the team to validate Google investing in Africa. So obviously, when Google wanted to actually invest in Africa, my company, Space Finish, was the one doing the job. Now, I'm not saying that we all have to talk to Googles and Facebooks and Twitters, but I'm saying within your network, how can you be a facilitator? Because the skill sets that we have as architects, we need to put, a, put more premium on the value, and that value changes when you're when having a conversation much earlier in the value chain versus at the end, when you've already decided everything. And we've done this locally with the local brands. Whether it's Stanbic Bank, GT Bank, Sterling Bank, we are helping them solve all their problems by aligning them with the fintech uh, industry. So the third point I want to talk about is, is data. We all say that we are data-centric, but we're not always really data-centric. You see, the thing about our profession is you are at the forefront to capture all this data. Your customer is giving you so much information about what they want, how they use their space, foot traffic, so much information that we can actually use. You see, we tend to look at data to validate our past decisions, but we can use data to predict the future. You see, when you can gather a lot of data and use machine learning, you can begin to predict trends. So with our new company campus, we can begin to design floor plan layouts before we speak to the customers, because we have so much information about what companies want. So that saves time 
and adds value to the customer. And anybody who can predict the future can add a lot of value. And if you can add a lot of value, you can make a lot of... I can't hear you guys. Money, you are with me. So only the data predicts the future and people will pay you for it. So there's a company called Steelcase. Steelcase is the biggest furniture manufacturer globally. We partner with Steelcase to gather data on a project, but the data we gathered benefited us as we moved to work with other uh, companies. So this is an example of how we are doing it. And if we are doing it, then it means that you guys too can do it. So you. I want to talk about AI. How many of you guys are familiar with artificial intelligence? Fantastic. When I talk to a lot of architects, they, they argue with me a lot. They tell me that AI is not better than them. By a show of hands, how many of you guys think that you can put out the same output of work as artificial intelligence can? Show of hands. No one? One person? Okay. Let me prove you wrong. So, with AI, AI can get you 100,000 versions of a floor plan in one second. Right? We've seen AI doing things like creating artworks and all that stuff. But right now, there seems to be a nervousness that we are being replaced. But I have a different view of what the future is. I think the future is the architects are no longer going to be the creators, but they are going to be the curators. Now, if you are no longer the creator, you now have to begin to flex new muscles that allows you to curate. And if you are curating, the key thing you are doing is you are getting very good at choosing. So if AI is giving you 100,000 permutations of a floor plan, how do you choose the one that is right? To choose, you have to get very good at building your vision. You have to get very good at all the ethical considerations, inclusion, safety, sustainability. You have to get very good at things like storytelling. Because while AI can create the design, it's you that will select all the different designs, put them together to tell the best story. And if you emphasize on this skill set, as the future changes, you will be able to add a lot more value. You see, there was a time in the past where people were riding horses and the car was invented. You know what happened to those horses? Obsolete. There was a time where we were all at home. If you're old enough, you had landlines. And today, you all have cell phones in your pockets. Who else has a landline in the house today? Obsolete. So it's disrupt or be disrupted. Change always. People are always looking for the most convenient thing for them. And technology ushers in that change. So I'm trying to say that we are seeing the changes happen today with artificial intelligence. And we need to be on the right side of history when those changes happen. The other thing that people fight me about is... AI is going to kill creativity. How many of you guys feel that way? Okay. Let me also prove you wrong. You see, I analyzed a lot of the projects that my company, Space Finish, has done. And the most iconic things that people compliment us about was done in just 10% of the time for the entire project. The remaining 90% of the time was spent drafting modeling, rendering. Nobody sees a nice building and say, wow, let me see the rendering for that building. It's the ideas and the creativity that people value. So if you can instruct AI to handle all the mundane tasks, all the drafting, all the rendering, all the modeling, you now have more time to be creative, to talk to your customers, to create the right stories to be more human-centered with your design approach. So it actually gives you time to be more creative. So imagine you take that 10% of time that you would have spent on ideation, and you now flip the model. You now spend 90% of time on ideation because AI is working for you, and 10% of time on choosing because AI is doing all the drafting for, 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 for you. You would have more creativity, not less creativity. So the gentleman in the back that raised his hands, have I convinced you? Okay, so I haven't convinced you, but afterwards we'll talk. But this is my view. My view is that AI makes you more creative because you have time 
to spend on the important things. Since the beginning of time, human beings have been trying to conquer time. We don't want to work. Because what is work? Work is doing those things that you don't want to do, but you have to do. But if you can eliminate that work and do the things you actually want to do, it's going to be the creative stuff. And that is the role that I see AI providing us in us being a lot more innovative. Now, moving on to the next slide. This slide is for all the business owners. How many of you guys in this room own businesses? Okay, fantastic audience. What is your exit strategy? You see, now that you're young, when you're older, when you're in your 60s, and you've been designing and designing and designing, you have your firm, and you want to go and retire, what's going to happen to your company? You see, in this part of the world, we haven't figured out how to build sustainable businesses. These are businesses that continue beyond the founder, right? So one of the key things that we've been trying to do is, how do I ensure that my business is not reliant on me, Remy? So when I choose to retire, it can continue. The founders of GT Bank are no longer in GT Bank. Why is that possible? Why can't that be the same for architectural firms? A lot of architectural firms die with the founder. So what is your exit strategy? To build your exit strategy, there are a couple of things that you can do. The first is you need to build a sustainable business, meaning you need to have systems and processes, right? You have to have systems and processes that allow you, that are not reliant on one individual. So if anyone replaces that person doing the work, the work can continue, right? A lot of technology companies have figured out how to exit. You hear all these stories of these companies that IPO'd, they got acquired by another company. The only reason the company can acquire you is if they see a future in that company. You will only buy something that can make you more money, right? So to do that, a couple of things need to be done. Number one, how do you gather your intellectual property? And how do you protect your intellectual property? First. Second, how do you set up your business to bring your current revenue? If I'm buying your business, I want to know you have a pipeline of guaranteed sales that are coming in. You can get to that by partnering with businesses that have long uh, uh, pipelines of deals. So that way, as you're talking to, I don't know, an investor, you can guarantee them that with these partners, I can earn X amount in the next five years. Somebody will buy into your future pipeline. I've spoken about processes and systems. Eliminating key man risks. A key man risk is that person in your company, without them, no one can move. It shouldn't be that way. You have to have a system where everyone within your organization has a successor. So if somebody leaves, the knowledge doesn't leave with that person. And this goes all the way from the junior staff all the way to the leadership. So if I leave my company, my team members also know what to do because these things are documented. And like I said earlier on, building products and software. You build products and software, you create value that people can actually buy. So today I said I was going to talk about key things and if you take away just one of those things, I'll be happy. The, the very first is to own the product and control the value, meaning architects being not just consumers of technology, but creators of technology. The second point was participate much earlier in the value chain. You can do that by engaging much earlier. You can do that by facilitating meetings. You can do that by facilitating investments. We all have relationships that we can leverage to allow us to participate much earlier in the value chain. And the third is being more data-centric. Understanding that your data can allow you to predict the future, and that is value that people will pay you for. And then we also spoke about having an exit strategy for those of you who own businesses, so that one day in the future you can retire and still continue to earn from your business. And the last thing was artificial intelligence, AI. AI is opening the door for the future. It's not closing the door. And you need to understand the changes that are happening. And you need to ask yourself, if AI continues to improve, what are the things that, how are you going to add value in that future? So those are the key things I wanted to talk to you guys today. I have five minutes left for some questions and answers. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You have really done well. So my question goes to us. You made mention of using make of opportunities that come around. So I want to ask because we are in Nigeria and not everybody had the privilege to travel out of the country currently. So I want to ask, as a Nigerian we are, or as a young youth of Nigeria, how can I personally or can we seek this particular opportunity you're talking about? Because when talking about opportunity, we're talking about space we can fill in. And because we, when we lack exposure, we lack experience, how can we bring this together to work out? So, so how basically can I seek the opportunity okay. you're talking about? Okay, so fantastic question. So one of the key things is, it's all about your mindset. How you see yourself allows you to see the opportunities around you. And there's opportunities around you. And what you need to do is look within your own network. Within your network. And begin to think about yourself, not just as an architect, but as a solutions provider for businesses. The key things I said is being in the center of conversations, bringing people together. How often do you bring different people that you know who are business people together? How proactive are you in doing that? Right? And then help to facilitate investments. You know somebody on the left that has some money. You know somebody on the right that needs some money. A lot of times we just want to get the money from this person. But sometimes bringing the two people together can create an opportunity that you can be a part of. Right? But the most important thing is your mindset. Seeing yourself something a lot bigger than being an architect and a business solutions provider allows you to see opportunities that you were not seeing before. My question is on processes and system. I want to ask, how were you able to go about providing systems and processes for your business? And how were you, to, were you able to leverage on people you knew starting up in the business? Okay, so the last question, I'll take that first. When I started off in the business, I leveraged on my place of employment because that was the closest thing to me, right? And I convinced my place of employment to allow me to do design for them for free. I didn't get paid for it. I got that portfolio and I went to the next person close to me, a friend who worked in another company, and I convinced that friend to look at my one portfolio and have him hire me. And by this time, I didn't do it for free. I charged, right? So it's all about, we all have connections around us. We don't live in isolation, leveraging those connections. And the second question around systems and processes is, the beauty about your question is that the answer to that question is a Google search away, right? There's no science to creating systems. A system is just a set of activities in a sequence that need to be followed to achieve a task. So whether it is make sure you use this this, um, this version of Revit, make sure you save files in this way, whatever that system is, you need to just document it so the new person coming in can just read it and you don't have to be there to tell them over and over again. So guys, sorry, we'll talk afterwards, okay? Thank you very much.